Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Photographer's Favorites where I have another photographer join me to pick five of their favorite photos of other photographers. I chose five of mine. We share them, talk about what we like, and see if any other stories come up. So today I have with me Kathy, Co Kathy Cochran. Thank you so much for joining me, Kathy. Thank you. Yeah, um, really appreciate you having me, uh, joining me here. Um, how long have you been doing photography, Kathy? Uh, seriously, probably for about eight years and casually for maybe 10 years prior to that. Okay, nice. When you first got into photography, what genre of photography was it? Wildlife. Yeah, it was wildlife uh, from the beginning, huh? Yes, I picked it up with a trip to Botswana. Oh, and that'll do it. <laughs> and totally fell in love with the whole concept of trying to capture action in, in wildlife. It was yeah. really a challenge, but a wonderful experience. It is challenging, isn't it? It is because the lighting is not under your control, nor is the behavior. Sure. And um, you're usually in a vehicle and can't get out and, and position the way you'd want to because, you know, that's a lion out there. Yeah. So it, it does pose challenges, but uh, it's just so wonderful to be in the presence of, of such magnificent wildlife. I'm sure, definitely. Uh, that's certainly one of the areas of the world I've never been to, would love to get to. And so a little bit different than the wildlife photography I do, where I don't really generally have to fear about being eaten. Um, <laughs> I mean, I do spend some time in Florida, so there's a little bit of that, but not quite the same. Yeah, yeah I can't say I've been to Florida since like 1962. I just okay. think of it hot, human, and it rained a lot when I was there. Yep. Yep. Sounds about right. Uh, pretty accurate, <laughs> but it can be a beautiful time. I spend the winter down there usually, so it's a little bit more uh, mild temps. Yeah. All I right. So Northwest, which is very mild and temperate. So. Oh, that's right. I did want to um, actually ask you that. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. And so you probably not only do wildlife now, obviously on your website, you kind of branch out into a lot of other stuff. Um, when did you start the uh, equine photography? Uh, approximately three years ago, I've taken several workshops from a wonderful photographer named Tamara Gooch okay. and takes us out to photograph incredibly beautiful horses on the beach, in the forest, um, in, in arenas. And oh, nice. it's been a fabulous thing. It's a little bit like wildlife, only a little bit more controlled. So it sure. has the best of both worlds. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Right. So a little bit more ability to explore your creative side, right? Right. Yeah. Definitely. Excellent. Yeah, very cool. Well, yeah, I'll definitely point everybody to your website to check that out. Um, you ready to get into the show? I certainly am. Let's do it, Kathy. All okay. right. So the first photo you chose here was from uh, Tamara Gooch. And so what an awesome zebra photo. Uh, the, uh, the head on the back there, it's like, come on, like the connection between those two animals is incredible. And uh, while I've certainly never photographed any of these animals, I've seen plenty of photos of these animals. And I think there's a lot of a, there's a lot of opportunity to have them get lost amongst themselves and with all these stripes and everything. But uh, the depth that Tamara used here, it, it almost looks like it's kind of like a, a dusty kind of, um, you know, open plain here. So it almost looks kind of dusty as it heads off into the background, which... I think is great. It gives a lot of depth to the photo and really kind of brings your eye to these foreground uh, pair of zebra. And then um, just, yeah, that interaction between the two there just really, really makes it for me. Um, yeah. What did you think of the shot? Well, I totally agree. I liked that she chose black and white, um, especially given the topic, but I think it allows you to focus more on the pattern of the stripes, yeah. which is really the dominant feature of the photograph. I have been to Africa and tried to photograph zebras. Okay. Um, they are a challenge, uh, especially yeah. if they're against a fairly, you know, just grass plains sure. background. It, it, uh, she found a way to get a herd, which is difficult to do with zebra. I would imagine. They don't typically gather like that. And since she's the one that I've done workshops with for equine photography, I, I can see exactly why she took this picture because yep. she does emphasize the relationship between horses or between a horse and a person okay. as the story behind a picture. And that's, that's really why I like it. 
Excellent. Yeah, it definitely does have that story, that connection there. It's more than just a sec like, I mean, if we imagine if it was just this zebra standing here and then this one was standing looking that way, it'd still be a really cool shot, but it wouldn't have that extra little bit to it that this photo has. And it really kind of just takes it to the next level. Yeah, it's got a nice emotional undertone to it that yep. causes you to think as you look at it, which is usually, I think, the primary reason to do photography is to sure thing. provoke thought and emotion. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's certainly a goal every time, right? Um, I know I certainly don't probably do that with every photo I share, but uh, the ones that do, I think, uh, ring true with a lot more people in that regard. Especially wildlife photography. Yeah. If you're doing still life, I, somehow it's difficult to evoke emotion with a picture of a vase. It can be. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, like, it's more of a challenge creatively, but when you have behavior of an animal, most sure. people can relate to, to an animal yep. because you know, animals think and they behave and they act and those acts connote emotion oftentimes. So yeah, definitely. That's, that's why I like wildlife photography. Yeah. And one other thing I want to mention before we move on to the next one, the, uh, the fact that like you suggest, you pointed out, she went with black and white here. This is a photo that honestly, it looks like it could have just been shot that way without even converting it black and white. It looks like there's almost no color to the photo to begin with, you know? And, uh, I think that obviously makes a perfect choice to go to black and white. Cause it almost already started off that way. You know, um, I can't tell, obviously maybe there would have been more color with some of the dirt and stuff like that back there, but, uh, probably not a lot of color in the original. Yeah, it's a little hard to tell if they're all zebra in the background. I presume they are, but you know they gather around um, other creatures, you know, in sure. wildlife, like antelope, and those would have some color. So, yep. I, th I think it was a deliberate choice. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, let's keep going. Oh, and here is uh, Tamara's um, Instagram for anybody curious, and I'll certainly be linking to that anyway. So, yeah, it's just obviously some gorgeous uh, equine photos there. So, incredible yeah. stuff. She focuses on equine and uh, her workshops are wonderful. So yeah, seems it seems it definitely. Well, thanks for introducing me to her. I've never uh, followed her. So always nice to have new people to follow. All right. Here's the first photo I chose. This is from Mo. Something a little different there. Definitely. Um, you know, I always like any photo that captures water in motion, such as a splash. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I find myself having difficulty doing that uh, unless I'm shooting with a very rapid frame, like sure. 11 frames a second, you're apt to catch something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I shoot with a, a D850 Nikon, okay. which, which has a really good fast rate. Yep. Uh, and until it buffers, you can get a hundred shots of that and get one out of those that will have the perfect splash. Just the great splash. Yeah. Yep. And there's good detail on the feathers. Uh, yeah. Which is a challenge, you know, when you have a light colored bird like that, sometimes, you know, you just got to get the contrast just right and adjust it and then probably try to get a little bit of glow too. Uh, and I just think that was accomplished very well here. 100% agree with everything you said. Yeah, definitely a challenging exposure situation there with a light to, you know, either a white or kind of grayish bird. Uh, I'm not sure the species, I don't know the um, this is from South Africa, it says here. So I don't know the South African heron and egret species. It definitely looks like an her a heron or egret species based on the neck shape and that sort of thing. Um, in any case, it's a light bird on a very dark background. And it also looks like it's either, you know, probably either an overcast day or the bird is just in complete shade because I don't see any sun direction to it or anything like that. And so uh, that kind of softens the light on the bird and it really shows off this splash too because we don't have any, you know, hard like shadows on the bird or shadows from the splash or any of that stuff. It's just nice kind of soft lighting and uh, how cool to see the reflection there too of it, you know, of yes, just like the, the whole splash happening. Yeah. The reflection of, of both the bird and the, the uh, splash. Yeah, just, yeah. I really like it. Yeah, yeah, it's beautifully shot and uh, and well edited and well presented. And again, I guess it's looking like another black and white too. I just kind of realized that uh, that there's no color in the shot. So yeah, um, not an easy thing to do. Have you ever done much black and white conversion in your wildlife photography? Because I almost never do it. I I, you know, maybe occasionally, but for the most part, I I like the color. Um, yeah, same here. It's part of the the story of the wildlife. Is is the color, if you're looking just for the patterns, perhaps switching to black and light, white, like for the zebra shot uh, would be a good idea. But for the most part, 
you know, I look for a soft background color such as, you know, the, the grasses in Africa are very soft anyway. Sure. So it creates a nice background for a, a photograph with a strong foreground. Yeah, definitely. And I do think black and white photos and wildlife can exaggerate or kind of enhance certain graphical, like a graphical nature of a photo and patterns and stuff like that. And this one, you know, the zebras obviously with the patterns, this photo, obviously like just the graphical nature of the, the long neck coming down and the splash. And so it can be done to great effect. I just think it's pretty difficult to do and, and personally find myself never doing it. So something I should probably explore more. Yeah. And it's good to come in from the upper right, not quite corner, but it, it creates yep. a pleasing rule of thirds kind of photograph, although I guess the action is right in the center, but it tells a story from the right to the left. Yeah, and the splash comes out the other side, so you got like a nice like V happening here. So yeah, really good shapes on this one. Yeah. All right, you ready to get to the next one? I certainly am. All right, this is another one you chose here. <laughs> Speaking of emotion, you know, that's elicited when you look at a photo, I mean, come on, like, does it get any cuter than that? You know, this, uh, this giant... I'm sure can at times be intimidating polar bear just looking super adorable in the pose sitting back on its haunches like that with the paws up uh, incredible light just real soft light there no distraction in the photo whatsoever so we got a nice smooth background uh, excellent use of space here too from Aaron the uh, the space in front of the bear is just right you know so the photo feels well balanced and I mean, it's just, yeah, it's adorable. You know, what, what a shot. I, and I got to say, very unique too. I have seen a lot of polar bear photos. I've never seen one like that. I've seen them standing up taller, but this one just kind of seems to be sitting back up tall as well. It's kind of an interest. It's a really interesting pose on the bear. Yeah, I really like it. Um, I, I was not on this trip with Aaron, but Aaron is a wildlife photographer with a very big following, um, yeah. Aaron Stoss. And uh, he does do a trip up to Kaktovik up in Alaska, which is pretty much within the Arctic Circle. I'm nice. quite sure that's where this was taken. Um, when I w went up with him, we had um, a, a boat. We were going to be taking shots like this from a boat onto land. But unfortunately, um, the bay froze over. And so we didn't end up doing it from a boat. That'll we put a damper on things. <laughs> yeah, we had to rent an old school bus. Um, and we would go out looking for shots and, and usually those shots were uh, wherever a whale carcass was sure. because that's where the bears would, would come. Yep. So very interesting to photograph bears in that particular context because uh, sadly because the whale is dead but you do get bright red with the white in sure. that kind of photograph um, and you do get a lot of behavior of course. Uh, yeah. Uh, this one is unique because, you know, Aaron was photographing, I'm sure, from a boat in the water. And the bear is probably looking at that action out there on the water, which is why he's up. Yeah. Uh, I just love photographing polar bears. And it is a challenge because by definition, it's white on white, once sure. again, yep. which is a challenge, I think, for any photographer. And Aaron is just marvelous at that. And he teaches um, people like me very well when we're out on Excellent. the scene. Nice. So, Nice. Yeah. Uh, it's such a great photo. Yeah. You can just kind of really stare at this one for a while. Uh, really enjoyable shot. Yeah. So nice choice. All right. Keep sticking with the mammals. <laughs> this uh, moose, of course, there's the water again. And I always yeah. do like capturing that. Um, and I think you shot this or the uh, artist shot this again in black and white. Yes. So yeah, we're ending up with a lot of black and white here. I didn't even know we didn't plan that either. That's too funny. No, we didn't. Um, I, I do think black and white photography does tend to emphasize sort of the artistry of, of the photographer yep. more so than perhaps color does. Um, this particular one um, cuts off the, um, the horns a little bit, which they tell you not to do, um, at least when I've taken workshops, but it works here. It really, it really does. does it focuses the attention on the, on the muzzle yep. and on the water and on the eyes. And that's really the story. This You're right. clearly just dipped in probably a river or something yeah. and is looking up. My suspicion is, is looking up at a photographer who's taking his picture, <laughs> uh, but it does tell a, pic, a story and you want to know the story. So that's one reason I like it. And the dark background, of course, um, in this particular 
case emphasizes the hide and the, and the lining on the moose. And you probably don't catch that that might be added in post-processing because I don't know that you could catch a moose quite like that without some background. Yeah, it might. It looks like it might just be a little bit of burning around the edges, but looks very natural. Nothing crazy, you know. It really fits the photo, and uh, and really helps draw into where all that, you know, attention should go. Yeah, I don't know this photographer, but I suspect um, he took this or she took this maybe in Yellowstone. Um, uh, so uh, let's see. It's, it's Benjamin, and he said for years he's dreamt of this intimate encounter with war, water pouring off the antlers after investing thousands of hours. Uh, I'm trying to think of where he is based out of, and let's see if this. I don't know if he has any like tags on it that mention where it was. Um, yeah, I'm not not really sure exactly where. Oh wait, here we go. Oh, well, that's funding for moose in Minnesota. I think he does work around Minnesota, though, so it may be there. Um, yeah, not positive, probably. though. Yeah. It's a yeah, I know this photographer works with moose a ton, and so he's actually he spends a lot of time on specific uh, projects and that sort of thing. And so he puts in, as he mentioned in the caption, you know, in this case, probably thousands of hours over the last five years. Um, uh, completely agree with everything you said, Kathy. Love that, you know, it's totally fine. In fact, probably even better that the antlers are clipped just to bring you in on the action. Um, I'm always a fan of scenes of wildlife in habitat. I kind of like things smaller in frame. That's just my preference. But when a tight, close portrait is done so well, it's absolutely astounding. And I am all for it in that circumstance. And this image kind of just begs for that in your face, tight portrait, all about the, the action and the water drops that are going off here. So, uh, and then uh, bonus that these streaks of um, water are just like basically framing the eye and not going through the middle of the eye there. Like how lucky is that, you know? <laughs> You'd end up, I mean, imagine if you had like this huge water drop like that right over the eye, it would kind of lose that eye contact you get with the subject. So uh, yeah, he really got uh, lucky with that and nailed it, so. Now, I don't know uh, how close this was. You might have been shooting with a long lens, but moose are very dangerous. They so can be, yep. in a portrait like this of a moose, uh, I presume the photographer is on the shore, but one never knows. Uh, yeah, I do sure. admire that because uh, moose are more dangerous than bear, frankly. Yep, yep. Yeah, I have heard that. And I but I do know a few photographers that spend a ton of time with moose and I guess I kind of get the impression that in the right season, you know, not during the rut when they're really kind of ramped up and really chasing things and and kind of uh, a little bit more aggressive that with time and care and 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 mainly I would say, you know, someone like Benjamin here probably, you know, he said he spent 5 years tracking these things and working with them. Um, you probably start to learn behavior a little bit more. Uh, it's certainly something I would never even attempt to do because I've barely ever worked with moose. So I'm always going to keep my distance. Uh, but I think uh, sometimes mm -hmm. when you learn about these animals, you can maybe get a little bit more intimate encounters in a safe way, you know, but I, always something to be careful with. I remember trying to shoot, uh, photograph a moose and uh, it was in the rut. Yeah. And fortunately, yeah, I was doing it from inside my car because that moose started to charge. No kidding. And I sped away as quickly as I could get and he chased me uh, wow. for a good mile. It oh was startling. So that's why I admire a photographer who could get this close yeah. because I didn't succeed in that effort. Yeah. Now, one of my first encounters was this past year up in Maine. I was by myself hiking in the middle of nowhere, no cell service. And uh, it was just a cow moose. She had come out and it was like in the middle of summer. And she, she just startled me and I think I startled her too. Uh, she just came out on this path that I was walking along and then as soon as she saw me, she just bolted, but I wasn't expecting her at all. And so I just hear this crash at first, then I see her and it was just like, oh my gosh, you know? <laughs> so we're both, I think both of our hearts uh, got pounding on that encounter, but uh, I kind of went back to the car and stayed there for a while afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> they're bigger than you think. Um, oh, they're massive. Yeah. They are big, especially yeah. the males, but yeah, no um, it's, it's bigger than a horse. Let yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. All right, on to the next shot. Back to polar bears. All right, we're into color territory now. Speaking of, like I just said on the last one, right? I really love habitat shots. An excellent example of that. You know, just really showing off that Arctic habitat, uh, the ice flows, and it's really cool seeing the pair like that. Um, 
a mother mother and cub so larger cub too that's a little bit more self-sufficient but still hanging with a mother so it's kind of cool to see all two mo two almost near adult sized bears like that and you know i'm also usually a fan of kind of eye level um you know being on the subjects level kind of shots but this elevated shot kind of gives a lot better overview of the scene of what's around it that habitat you know if we if try and imagine being down on the ice level with these bears uh, you wouldn't get to see kind of the the patterns here and the structure of the ice and maybe the water in between the ice you'd probably just see an out of focus foreground bears and then out of focus background so um, this is a shot that I think elevating actually helps the shot as well so uh, and that love of the little splash of blue over there is really pretty yeah this was taken by Justin Black who uh, runs a photography workshop group called Visionary Wild, uh, and I have attended several of his workshops. He is just superb as a teacher and as a photographer. Uh, I don't think I went to this one with him. I've been in, uh, you know, Red Rock Canyon and such with him, okay. but I, I really admire his artistry, and he's very, very passionate about uh, helping other photographers, which is nice. wonderful. And yeah. one of the things he teaches and he, he taught me is to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And obviously this image is a very good example of that because you can picture they're, they're trying to get seals. Yep. They, they probably are having difficulty in this day and age getting sure. enough ice to get out to where they need to be to get the seals. And the cub is mm -hmm. dependent on the mother. So I, I just, it, it, it is thought provoking because it thinks, makes you think of global warming and, yep. and, and, things that are of concern, particularly for polar bears. Sure thing. Definitely. Yeah. Well, uh, well pointed out. Well chosen photo. All right. Let's keep going. So uh, this, uh, I don't, I, you told me what kind of bird it is. Three-toed woodpecker. A three-toed woodpecker. Yep. Uh, I have never been able to photograph a woodpecker, so I'm, I'm a little bit jealous. Um, okay. <laughs> The, here it has the splash of snow, which has the same impact on me. I really like catching that action because yeah. it suggests the, the forward movement of the woodpecker uh, by the backward splash of the snow. Um, and I like the angle that was captured of the tree. It's not just boring vertical. Yeah. It, it tells you a little bit about the shape of the tree and the work of the woodpecker. And the soft background is perfect. It suggests the snowy climate, but without just pure white. So there's enough of a modeling there to create some interest. So uh, I think it's a great photograph. Yeah. Uh, it's black and white. I think there's a little bit of color in it there. It is not. But... Yeah, there's a little color and a little splash of yellow. Uh, I was just going to say that was the one thing that I kind of kind of really stood out to me is uh, it almost looks like a monochrome image, except for the fact that you got that splash of yellow. And then when you really dig in, you can see a little bit of blue tones and some brown tones on the tree. So mm -hmm. it is a color image. But uh, again, 100% agree with everything you said. Um, and that that snow and motion like that really does what we've talked about a few times. That's a great thing, right? It tells the story. It tells the story of the action of that thing, that, that woodpecker actually pecking at this tree and that sort of thing. And um, the narrow, you know, I assume it was a, a low uh, f-stop yeah. uh, because it blurred the background just perfectly and, and captured just the thin frame of, of a beautiful bird. Yep, tree in focus, bird in focus, background, just nice and smooth, but not, like you said, right, not so smooth that it's just a, a white sheet or just a gray sheet back there with no, no detail. It's got some texture to it and a little bit of patterning to it that just kind of, you know, indicates more of the forest back there, which is great. Uh, I love that it's shot just right at eye level, which, you know, a lot of the times, obviously, I I've never worked with this species. This is from Norway. But uh, a lot of the woodpeckers locally tend to like being up higher in the trees quite often. So, um, and it's not always quite the same connection when you're pointing up at those birds. So this is great that he's eye level with it. Uh, lighting is just amazing. Even though it's soft, it just works well to show off all the right details. And then the texture on this tree along with the snow, uh, like you said, in addition to having some angle to the tree, which is a good thing, it's not a boring tree at all. It's got so much character in this tree. It's not just like a flat tree trunk or something like that so yeah all yeah, those things make it great it makes you question now what kind of tree is that is that a birch or whatever it almost uh, has a birch look to it but i have no idea yeah, yeah. <laughs> i so suck I with tree identification how are you <laughs> me too okay <laughs> <laughs> all 
<laughs> I can I can pull a moose from a horse. So that's, that's true. <laughs> that's a good start. <laughs> oh, this was one of the favorites when you sent this over. This one, man, I'm I'm such a sucker for kind of silhouettes and the color on this one and that sense of movement. I actually really like that the uh what is this it's uh, an arabian fox i like that the fox is partially hidden behind the rocks but we still see all the right shape in all the right places so you know if it was hidden too much it might be hard to see kind of the shape of this fox and you can really see how this is a little bit more of like a sleek um you know it's not like an, a, a heavy type fox uh, or any uh, kind of canid build so they're a little bit more slender build uh, the real thin tail i love seeing the leg come back that indicates the motion so it's not just standing there it's moving through these rocks and then uh yeah, just the colors are incredible. And you, know, you say Arabian Fox and it just is like, man, there's when you think for us anyway, for me, somebody that's never been to that area of the world, um, I hear Arabia and you just think kind of desert, sandy, orange, those sunsets, right? That's just the, the vision that pops into my head. And this kind of captures all that in this photo. So I think it kind of um, belays the story of where these fox live. And uh, yeah, just a beautiful shot. Love it. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. I particularly like, I think this photographer got up early and this is probably a sunrise rather than a sunset, but the, the gradation of that orange to yellow color just adds real impact um, to the silhouette. Yeah. And getting the silhouette of a fox in the wild at sunrise against rocks is just yeah. amazing. I mean, there was probably a lot of work that went into getting on this location and catching that shot. No so, doubt really really appreciate it yeah and shots like this usually uh you know obviously we don't know the the full story behind it but usually you don't just it's, it's not just a chance encounter sometimes i mean it can be those can happen and those are magical when they do happen but more often than not the photographers put in a lot of work days months years in advance um figuring out these the habits the fox the terror the territory the habitat all that stuff so um uh, certainly some of that may have gone into it i don't know in any case it's a great photo. Yeah. So got up very early in the morning to be at that location, which this I this one actually I was just reading. It does say sunset. Oh, really? <laughs> in well, her I caption, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was wrong. She didn't uh, get up so early, but she stayed up late. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and who knows, right? Was maybe there all day. You never know. Yeah. Could be. Love the shot. Yeah. Another silhouette ish. Yeah. My first impression of this, um, I think you told me what kind of bird it is, but it almost looks like a rooster that's crowing, you know, into the light. And I know it isn't, but I like that image because it evokes that for me. Yeah. Um, and especially, I guess it's about Thanksgiving, but uh, I like, you know, once again, here's a silhouette and uh, it's got a, a really interesting background with the gradated, you know, blue, yellow to blue sky. Yeah. Um, the shape is perfectly captured with just enough context to tell a story. Uh, so I, I really like it. Tell me what kind of bird that is. It says so. Black probably. grouse. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, you know, kind of, you know, in that same fowl kind of category, right? So same shape, same similar kind of behaviors. And yeah, um, my guess is uh, these were, he was probably up on the lek. Um, I think he even said that. I, I know I read some of them. And uh you know, these birds come up at sunrise and they start you know, calling and performing their courtship display during their mating, like their, uh, you know, their courtship time of the year. And so, you know, you got, but I, I, I also read in this photo that, uh, let's see, um, he had to go up the night before, camp out overnight, and then actually uh, photographed it in the morning at sunrise. So that's putting some effort in. Absolutely love that he shot at wide angle too. I mean, this is a gorgeous shot without the wildlife, right? It's just a beautiful yeah. scene. The mountains back there, the sunrise, just incredible colors. So all of this stuff uh, just comes together. And then you add that amazing wildlife and behavior on top of it. And it's just great. And I think one last thing is if we really dig in here, it looks like a second bird right back there. Oh, you're right. Yeah. I hadn't that. Yep. Yeah, and Sorry. you know, honestly, the first impulse of a bird shot is to, to get the color of the bird as opposed to a silhouette. Yeah. Um, I mean, certainly for me it is, and I really appreciate the fact that this fellow went for the silhouette 
I mean, it's, it's really just beautiful. I'm going to have to start thinking differently about bird photography. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it can do that emotion, you know, and then the sunburst on this is just a, a really cool, like the placement of the sun there and everything like that is just absolutely incredible. So yeah, pretty cool. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it is. Yeah. This is a tripod setup he mounted the day before and uh, he hid under the camouflage. Yeah. So he had the camera. So he was laying there under camouflage. His iPhone was connected to the camera and cause he didn't have a remote trigger for it. So that was how he fired the camera when the uh, grouse got up there um, and started doing that. He had his camera set up and was under camo and then triggered it. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't get up early and I don't get up in the cold. So I, I totally admire the effort that this photographer put into a, a great shot. Definitely put some effort in there. Yeah. All right. How adorable. Yeah. Uh, look at that. The interaction there. Also love <laughs> the, uh, the mother Fox is just like squinting eyes uh, just has this expression of like, leave me alone. Like, come on, you know? Uh, and then the, uh, the kit is just playing away right there. So, uh, such a hilarious photo, so much, um, emotion interaction that goes into it. Beautiful, soft light, beautiful foxes, eye level, little splashes of purple flowers around it right there. Uh, the vertical composition works really well to kind of just bring us into that action. Cause it all, the whole frame just it just feels like it should be vertical, you know? Uh, so just everything just so well composed and well shot and just a beautiful interactive shot. Yeah. Uh, I know this photographer, I, I was on a shoot with him for Milky Way photography and we sat for hours under the Milky Way. And who is get, it again? His name is Clement Stevens. Clement Stevens. Okay. He yeah. Up in Bellingham, Washington. And those are snow geese that he photographed in Skagit Valley. Okay. And I'm, here, this photograph is probably taken in the San Juan Islands. Uh, I'm not positive, but yeah, it's the San Juan National Park. Uh, and there's a lot of fox there. Uh, I've never seen a mother a cub. I guess they're called kit. Maybe they're kits. kits I've never yeah. seen that kind of pairing. Uh, so to capture this story in that location, yeah, I, I just love it. And I'm not surprised at all that, that Clement caught it because he's a very patient photographer, and this kind of shot takes patience and a great deal of talent. And you're right, it's a nice uh, neutral but storytelling background as well as the, the uh, wonderful story of the foreground. So Yeah, those splashes of purple flowers in there are just so nice. They just add a, such a nice little uh, bonus to the photo, but don't distract in any way, shape or form, so yeah. And you know, the closed eyes of the mother you usually wanna get the catch light in the eye, but that's an important part of the story because the yep. mother is enjoying the nuzzle from her kit. Yep. So I, I just think it's perfect in every way. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, and the expression on the kit is just so childlike and playful and that sort of thing. And I mean, pretty standard for those kits, but uh, yeah, it's a great one. It really is. Mm -hmm. Well done. All right, last shot. This shot I, we discussed a little before we started because on my screen, I'm not seeing uh, the subtle textures right behind the bird. Uh, so it comes across as mostly black which of course is very dramatic. It's, it's the opposite of high key, yeah. um, but it has the same impact. Um, there's a story here that the, the shape of the bird is, is really beautiful. Um, and the fact that it's you know a distant bird and not filling the frame actually adds to the story. I think it suggests a distance and it suggests sort of a mysterious uh, quality about this particular capture. Um, it's a very pristine white and, and the beak comes through beautifully with the contrasting color. Um, there's enough shadow and, and contrast in the bird that you're catching the, the texture of the wings, which yep. I think is always very important when you're doing any kind of bird photography. So, you know, and it's in the upper third and, and you wonder about everything that's going on in the other part of the image. <laughs> yeah. The enchantment of it is that it, it, it draws you in and it creates curiosity as well as wonder. So I really like it. Yeah, uh, very much agree with everything you said. The um, 
that just the fading in of those green pine trees that this egret is on is great. Uh, the, the thought of the photographer to compose it this way, expose it this way, like this is obviously like pretty much every photo we've seen in this series today. Uh, they're not just snapshots. There's thought that goes into these photos, you know, thought about the lighting, the exposure, the composition, all the important things and, uh, you know, well edited again. And when I really dig my eye in, I can see there's just there's a lot of foreground blur here. So he's shooting through some foreground stuff that's probably hiding some of the texture of the other trees that are back there on the same plane of the bird, which again, just helped to really zero our eye in on the subject there. So there's just so much going on that just draws your eye to that bright white bird on the dark green scene. And uh, also this, the, the composition works so well with the head placement, the head angled down, like you said, right? We're wondering what's down there. The bird's even looking down in that direction. So just everything kind of, it just all comes together so well with that, so. Oh, you know what? Just lost your audio, sorry. Oh no. Composed image in every way. Sorry, can you repeat that? I just lost your audio on that last comment, sorry. Can you hear me now? You're good. Okay. Uh, I was just saying, I, I love the, the angle of the bird that points towards the lower right corner yep. because it, it creates a story of its own. And I, I think if you would positioned it so that the bird was pointing right instead of down, it would not have had the impact. Agreed. Yep. And, and it could have with this particular image just by turning your camera to get, quote, a straight bird. But this is a much better choice. Yeah. I really like it. Yeah, very much agree. Kathy, we did it. Good job. I enjoyed it. Yeah, so did I. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, yeah. Kathy, the best place for people to follow you, is it your website here? Yes. Images to Impact. I, I wondered why nobody ever stole that. I thought that was a perfect name for a photograph, for it's, a photographer. It's a good one. Nice and easy to remember too. Yeah. Yeah. So people can jump on right there, check out some of your photography. Uh, Kathy, thank you so much for sharing these photos with me. You, you've shared all new photographers, I think for me, I don't think I had seen or followed any of those photographers. So I very much appreciate that. And always great to see new work from others. And um, hopefully I introduced you to some new photographers as well. Definitely. I'm going to follow them. I have to go back and check the links, but I will follow them. They're very talented people. I'll be sure to share all those links when I share this episode. And with that, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Hope you're enjoying these. Let me know in the comments what you think, if you like some of these, if you have any photographers you think would be a great fit, or if you want to join, just shoot me a message. I'll see if I can add you to the list and get you on the schedule. Uh, Kathy, have a great night. Thank you so much. And we'll see everybody soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.